When I was in my mid-twenties, I was doing a side job as a nuisance wildlife trapper for the Florida Fish and Wildlife Commission. It was in the middle of summer, and I got a call from a local park. The FWC had just stocked the youth fishing pond, and they noticed some otter tracks. So they called me, because otters would quite literally decimate the fish population. I have to contact the manager and let them know I'll be on the property at odd times because of my primary job. I only used live traps so that I could relocate the animal to a safer pond. So the first night, I went with my friend Scott decided to go with me to see how I set the traps and track them to find where to set the traps. So we're hanging out on the little bridge that crosses the natural inlet into the pond in order to give ourselves cover and see if this is how they are entering the water without being seen by the massive amounts of people that are at this park daily. So we're having a casual conversation about life when I notice someone coming down the path to our right. Okay, that's fine. It's a public park and people are allowed in certain areas after sundown. Nothing weird about that. If it had been a whale walking down the sidewalk, that would have really caught my attention. So I mentioned someone is heading this way. We better stand up so as not to scare them. We both came out, and now is when things get a little odd. This person is wearing long pants and a hoodie in August. I'm sitting still and dripping sweat. How is this person standing? That's when it gets close enough for me to notice I can't see their face. My buddy turns us back to the thing and continues talking. I can't take my eyes off of it. When it gets within, I'd say, six feet of me, it no longer has legs and starts slowly fading out. And when it gets to a certain spot, it fades out completely. My friend goes quiet and asks me what happened to the guy and turns and looks at me. He says something along the lines of, Dude, why are you so white? It looks like you just saw a ghost. Oh shit. All I could say was, He's gone, man. He puffed. Just vanished. Nothing. I turn around and he's running as fast as he can to the truck. I start looking around trying to find this guy anywhere. Scott is screaming for me to get in the truck. To hell with this place. I take off running to get to the truck and we get the hell out of the Dodge. We get to his house and he grabs his roommate's rosary beads and starts praying. I just sit down and tell him we have to get back. He says not without extra protection. So we plan on taking our friend Colby with us the next night, but we decide to talk to the manager first to try and find out if anything weird has happened before. But we're expecting her to call us crazy and kick us out. We went back the next day and talked to the manager. She tells us that a local vet's office had put a memorial up for a young guy that was troubled and worked for them, caring for the animals. He had killed himself. Then she said something that gave me chills. She said he always wore a hoodie and was kind of to himself and what she considered emo. She tells us to bring cameras tonight and see if we can catch anything besides an animal. So we plan our little excursion, get a digital camera, pick up Colby and head out later that night. For some reason, I'm not thinking of wearing flip-flops. So we took pictures and video for about an hour in the area we saw him and got nothing. So we decided to go down the trail we saw him walk out of. We get probably a hundred yards down the wooded trail and I decide to have a pee. So I tell them to hold up a second while I do my business. The trail is partially lit, but still pretty dark. The most lighting comes from the ambient light from the park. Suddenly, I see a shadow step out from the woods. It comes onto the trail and starts walking away. I tell the guys to walk back and forth because I think I might be seeing the backlighting casting shadows down the trail, and I've lost sight of the figure due to the job at hand. So we walked a couple of yards up the trail, and it hit me that if it was a person, why didn't they make any noise walking down a paved path? Suddenly, we see the shadow ahead of us, and we're going to overtake it so as to keep from startling a person on a poorly lit trail. I yell out, coming up behind you. I just didn't want to surprise anyone. Then it stops dead, and we stop dead, because we notice that it's close to a light, and it's a solid black human figure. We're roughly a hundred feet away, and it turns around, 
and all three of us see two red eyes glaring back at us. So my buddy Scott goes, hey, we don't want any trouble, man. Then it starts pacing back and forth across the trail very quickly and we start talking. I asked what its name was and it just continued pacing. So finally, I get the nerve to take a few steps forward when suddenly it actually gets larger in size and turns toward us again with large red eyes and has what I would consider a threatening posture. So I back off and it stays the size but starts pacing again but now it has no legs. So we asked questions again and still nothing. I decided to move forward again and found out that was a mistake. As soon as I get close, it turns its face, now white with a dark body, mouth wide open. It starts charging. I bolt, running as fast as I can down the path and fly by my friends. And they're screaming, turning to run. I beat everyone to the truck. I see them running down the trail because I have the truck lights on and shining the lights down the trail. This thing is hot on their trail and they're almost to the truck. I'm so scared I've lost gross motor skills completely and can't put the key in the ignition. This thing is starting to get close enough to touch them. Scott does this weird spin throw move almost like he took a swing at it. Then it stops and turns around. Now it's glowing like pulsing light and going back down the trail. They hit the door and I've now cranked the trunk and it stops and turns back. I'm not about to find out what the fuck it is. So I throw it in reverse and haul ass. As we're going down the road and start talking, I notice my feet are killing me. That's when I realized I actually had run out of my flip flops. I asked Scott where the camera is. He had thrown it at the thing right before it turned around, pulsing with light. I have no idea what it was, and to this day, I don't know if anyone ever found my flip-flops or the camera. Nor do I really give a damn, because I won't go back. I'm 37 now, and this happened many years ago when I was 9, maybe 10. This happened in the church I grew up in. I grew up in a decent sized church that was founded around 1757. So to say this place had a lot of history is an understatement. Our church had a basement that our fellowship hall and kitchen along with the youth group room was in. Beside the youth group room was what we called a prayer room. Basically a small room with a single pew and a small altar for meditation and prayer. I had always heard rumours from the other kids that there was a ghost in the prayer room, but just chalked it up as imaginations in a dark hallway and room. My pastor, whom I adored, was a very honest and loving man. He often came to our home with his wife to visit. I looked at them as grandparents, and they treated my brother, sister, and myself as their grandchildren. When I asked him about it, he said that he thought he had seen someone in there once. But when he went in to check on them, no one was there. But he wasn't worried about it, because it seemed to be praying and was peaceful, so he didn't think I should worry. So a few weeks pass, and we're having a lock-in. For those that don't know, that's where all the kids and the youth pastor and some of the parents spend the night at the church and play games, watch movies, and eat together. We were all sleeping in the youth group room, and as children often do, I faked sleep and waited for everyone to go to sleep because I wanted to see if I could see this figure. Everyone falls asleep, and I get up and ease out the door into the now long, very dark hallway. I stand there trying to psych myself up, when I hear whispering coming from the direction of the room. Just very faint, and I'm thinking maybe I'm not the only one who has this idea. So I put my hand on the wall, and use it as a guide, because it's so dark. You can just barely see the light coming in from the outside windows through the door. The door to the room has a small square window to see in. I'm just tall enough to be able to see in. As I get closer, the whispering is just slightly louder, so I'm thinking maybe someone from the youth group has snuck in there with a friend and is trying to be quiet so as not to get into trouble. I reach out and push down on the handle to open it, but it's locked and won't budge. 
and wondering why they would lock themselves in when I move forward and look through the window. When I see it, I can't tell if it's male or female, just a figure with its back to the kneeling at the altar with its head down. I can see the light from the window through it. I jumped back, realising what I had just seen. I'm wanting to run and scream, but I'm scared it will chase me. So I just stood frozen. Then I notice the whispering stops, and I peep back in, and the room is empty. Thinking in my head this entity is watching me, waiting to pounce. I run like hell back down the hallway, go back in the room, and spend the rest of the night hiding under the covers. So for a little background, after getting a divorce, I met my now fiancé almost a year ago. I always felt she was an empath, but also possibly clairvoyant. She doesn't want anything to do with it, it scares the living shit out of her. However, she used to do astral projects as a child. She told me she did it every night until she was a teen. My aunt died before we met, so I never told her about her. We were very close, my aunt and I. My dad died a month before my uncle passed of prostate cancer. She would take me fishing all the time with her. Through that, we found solace and kept each other from being so depressed. I loved her and looked up to her. When she passed, I was unable to go to her funeral. I lived 10 hours away and couldn't get it off work. I felt incredibly guilty and upset due to that. My fiancé and I had fallen asleep in our usual position her head on my shoulder, arm across my leg over me. When she woke up and hugged me and woke me up saying, babe, I need to ask you something. I of course told her to go ahead and she goes, did you have an aunt named Rachel that passed away? Then described her to a T. At this point I was in shock and said that I did. She then told me, well, she came to me in a dream, hugged me and told me to tell you that she was okay and to stop worrying. She loves you dearly and that she understands and is okay. She's never seen a picture, nor have I ever told her about my great aunt. Needless to say, she held me as I cried for a good 10 minutes. She was able to bring me closure for something she had no clue about. It started with a cut. I had not thought much of it at the time, nor could I tell you where I even got it from. It's the only thing I could think of that would explain it, how they got inside. It was a thin cut on the centre of my right palm. It hurt more than my ego would care to admit. As a precaution, I cleaned it and applied a liberal amount of antibacterial cream before covering it with a bandage. It had been a nuisance while pushing my computer mouse around with it, constantly reminding me of its presence. I lifted my hand and rotated my wrist. A rough series of cracks sounded off with the sensation of dragging a stick through gravel. Paper cuts and carpal tunnel, the hazards in my field of work. I turned my gaze to the bottom right corner of the screen, 4.48pm, 12 minutes from the end of the shift. My supervisor had already slipped out. They had tickets to something, it didn't matter. I wasn't paying too much attention at the time, truth be told. They had bragged the whole afternoon away and strutted out a full hour early. None of us had the desire to challenge the person above us on the food chain. God forbid if they found out I took less than 15 minutes at the end of the day. Not the most pleasant work environments, but it was the one that actually hired me. Perhaps my exploitability was my key asset. Most of the other workers had taken their chances and left soon after the supervisor's exit, leaving me behind. Seeing no one was around, I signed out and turned off my monitor. Sliding my papers into my pack, I lifted it by the strap with my right hand, not giving much thought to the action. I dropped it immediately in response to a shooting pain. I looked at my palm. The bandage was virtually pristine, save for the wrinkles caused by the curvature of my hand. Odd. It had felt as if I grasped a curling iron, or at least I imagine that's how it felt. I gingerly tested the strap with my right hand again. It seemed fine. 
the sensation had been far more severe than anything I had felt during the workday. I decided against putting further unnecessary stress on it. Using my left hand, I hoisted it around my shoulder. It had already fallen dark by the time I walked out into the office parking lot. I would have complained, but around this time last year, we had a significant snowfall. I was just happy I didn't have to drive home through the snow. My palm was throbbing. I had no gloves on me, so my hands were rather cold. But the sensation was far greater in my bandaged right palm. It was as if an icicle pierced right through its center. I hurried towards my vehicle in the corner of the empty lot. I flung the driver's side door open and tossed my pack into the passenger seat. My eyes opened, their vision consumed by a miniature mountain range of white that was a stucco ceiling. I blinked the sleep away from my eyes. A thought was developing, yet it dragged along, scraping the inside of my skull, refusing to form into anything coherent. I just laid still with an instinctual feeling that something wasn't right. Without my mind giving any de definition to this feeling, I was unsure how to act. My eyes remained on the ceiling. It was much like that which coated the ceiling of my parents' old home. I hadn't seen much of the unappealing substance since I moved out. My apartment's styling was an amalgamation of wood, concrete and glass. Perhaps a few years ago its design would have been considered inspired. I was not in my own bed. My eyes shifted downwards carefully. Light shone through the window a few steps from the foot of the bed. The walls were lined in yellowing wallpaper. The scent of years of cigarette smoke hung in the atmosphere. My eyes tilted to my right. The red digits of a clock sitting on the peeling wood of a nightstand read 7.23am. My attention drifted to the left. The sheets were in disarray, leaving the impression of another body that inhabited the space moments before. I slowly sat up. I took in my surroundings. There was a brown rotting desk in the corner with a seemingly ancient metal lamp upon it. A black tube TV was wedged into a cabinet sitting in front of the window. To its left, a door. Marked, beaten, wearing its years of abuse. The door's painted white metal acted like a canvas for the dark streaks and other miscellaneous smudges that adorned it. I was in a motel. A real dump of one at that. I waited for memories to materialise. Nothing came. The parking lot, then this. I felt my stomach churn. It was as if time lurched forward without warning. The room was dizzying. My head turned towards the left of the room. In the corner was the entrance to the washroom. I hesitated for a moment. Burgundy curtains were drawn part way across the window, cloaking the left side of the room in shadow. Despite my nausea, I had little desire to cross the threshold of darkness towards the washroom. Rubbing my face, a soggy bandage slightly caught on the bridge of my nose. A sharp response shot her from my hand, causing me to pull it away. It continued to ache dully as I inspected the warped bandage. Past my hand, my clothing and shoes sat amongst the mucky brownish red carpet. Without stepping down onto it, I leaned from the bed and snatched up my belongings. Hastily throwing them on, I stood up and began to make my way towards the room's exit. I heard something fall off the bed. A pillow or blanket, perhaps? I wasn't sure, but I heard something. I turned around, my back to the front door. It was faint. A moan of sorts, just barely audible. I wanted to pretend that I didn't hear it. I stood still, unable to control my motor functions. I just stared into the dark. The moment hung in silence. A pale, wiry hand slowly lifted itself from below, the other side of the bed. Its digits clawed a crumpled sheet. Low moaning emanated from the dark. The noise sustained, becoming louder with every moment until, without warning, it became a shriek. I broke from my daze and spun towards the door. I grasped its handle and flung it back, fleeing out of the room. I refused to look behind me as I sprinted, creating as much distance 
as I could from the thing in the room. The chill ate at my skin as I ran through the outer walkway of a weathered green building. The winter sun was just beginning to rear its head. I approached a metal stair set leading down to the car lot below. My shoes clanged against the steps, echoing out into the silent morning. Once I reached the ground floor, I stopped and surveyed my surroundings. I had no idea where I was. To add to my concern, my vehicle could not be found amongst the handful that was sitting in the front of the two-story relic of a building. I looked up towards the sign that sat atop a pole placed by the parking entrance. Motel was written in filthy fluorescent letters. The O was flickering. Scanning my surroundings, I noticed that the motel seemed to be tucked away in some sort of industrial district. I turned around to face the building I had just come out of. My breath plumbed in the brisk morning air. Looking past the second floor railing, I spotted the room that I had fled from. The door was still open. I couldn't make out much else beyond that. My legs began to move before my mind even seemed to command it. I had no direction, just the need to escape, to be somewhere, anywhere else than here. I was running towards the parking lot exit. In my mind's eye, the foul creature had crawled out onto the balcony, leaped down to the pavement and was chasing me on all fours, frothing at the mouth. Sound had been muted. All I could hear was the beating of my heart accompanied by rhythmic breathing. The air stung my throat as I ran straight into the street. I nearly caught my leg on a pothole as I ran helplessly without any direction. I could feel it gaining. My chest squeezed as I felt it right on top of me. I continued to run, heaving, nearly out of breath, like a racehorse about to collapse. Electricity danced around in my brain. The scenery began to darken. There was nothing, just a sound, liquid gurgling, distant yet all too close, a violent tremor. Something was shaking at my feet. I could feel its vibrations, yet I couldn't see. The veil was slowly lifted. Concrete, columns, dispersed across a barren grey landscape marked by yellow dividing lines. Pipes overlapped one another on the ceiling. Glaring light emanated from a strip of fluorescent bulbs hanging above. An arrow was painted in the middle of the path, followed by another which curved left, leading down a corridor that spiralled out of view. My entire body felt rigid. How was it possible that I arrived here unconsciously? I went to turn my neck and met a mild resistance. An invisible force tugged in the opposite direction as I turned to look to my right. It dissipated. A parking garage continued for some distance before me, with only a few cars scattered amongst the stores. My body ached and my eyes burned. I blinked a few times, trying to shake away my fatigue. The entire structure was silent save for that sound, rustling intermingled with a low gurgling, a sound that in my stupor I didn't register. As my mind fought through the distress of finding myself in another unknown location, I finally fixated on it. The origin of the noise was close, incredibly close. At first glance, it seemed as if I was alone in the structure. My gaze locked forward. Right where the arrows led off to the side, there was a concrete wall broken up by only the pristine metal doors of an elevator. In its reflection, was an obscured picture of myself and a dark blob directly at my feet. If the image on the doors was to be believed, something was laying right in front of me. It was just out of my vision. All I had to do was look down. The sound became more violent. It was that of a struggle. I felt something brush against my left leg. I tilted my head and looked down upon it. On the hard surface below me was a man. He wore a black raincoat and blue jeans. He had a thick brow and hollow cheeks. His eyes were light blue. These were the details that I attempted to focus on, trying to avoid processing the entire picture. The man was convulsing in his own fluids, arching his back upwards and slamming it into the concrete. 
Streaks of blood came from the stripes that his nails had carved into his throat. His left hand gripped his chest as his right continuously raked at his throat. Saliva and bile dripped from clenched teeth that looked like they were on the verge of shattering. All the while, his eyes were trained upon mine. I wanted to collapse, but my legs were locked in place. The body twisted and contorted to the point that I thought it was going to fold in on itself. Then it stopped. The man's back fell flat on the concrete. Stillness. Life left his eyes. The pupil stared directly at the ceiling. For a brief moment, I thought I noticed something. Just at the inner corner of the man's eye, something poked out. A bundle of dark strands with distinct bends in them part way. Each of them had irregular, jagged grooves. If I had to compare them to something, I would say they were almost like spider legs. They rotated and extended in each direction, then slid back inside from whence they came. The man's cold blue eyes darted right, looking directly at me. I stood in a dimly lit room. A warm liquid made its way down my right arm. There was a large gash in my bicep. I could see it, but couldn't feel it. A sensor light provided a slight amount of illumination from the outside. Glass was sprinkled across the carpet with intermittent bloodstains. My eyes followed the trail of red, which led to the remnants of a sliding glass door. It had been shattered. Something had even caught the frame, knocking it off the tracks. Past a bookshelf, just behind a sofa, something stuck out. I cautiously moved towards it. My legs stopped at the edge of the sofa. I leaned over. Not much detail could be discerned in the faint light, but I saw enough. A grown man, in a grey t-shirt and boxer shorts, lay on the floor face up, his feet sticking out just past the furniture. Behind me, a light wheeze glided through the air. I turned towards the noise. There had been a door behind me where I had come into consciousness. It was slightly ajar. A few glowing stickers that depicted smiling planets, stars and the like, were haphazardly thrown across it. At the centre of the doorway was a small silhouette of a body. It twitched. I felt my insides nearly collapsing on themselves. A soft whimper echoed through the building. My body became rigid. The cry sounded off again. It was muffled, but I could hear it all too well. My legs began moving, but not by my command. My neck twisted to the right. A carpeted staircase was before me. I continued towards the noise. I tried to stop, but my body continued. My arms, legs, nothing responded to me. I ascended the steps. As the stairs creaked, the cries peaked in terror. The sound, which once seemed almost silence, was now deafening. It was as if my hearing had blocked out everything else and isolated the noise. At the top of the steps, I passed by a hallway lined with family photos. My eyes remained locked forward. Stopping abruptly, I pivoted to the right. My vision was consumed by a door. Whatever was behind it attempted to hold its breath, but their heartbeat was painfully audible. Without warning, my body slammed repeatedly against the door. The person behind it began screaming. On the third try, the door flew off of its hinges. Inside, a street light shone through a window's blinds, revealing a dark-haired woman. She lobbed something. It collided with my left shoulder. I proceeded forward. She backed into the corner of the room, unable to say a word. I lunged forward and threw her to the ground. My hands latched onto her head, and began to pry her jaw open. Leaning above her, I felt my body shake as my mouth began to stretch open. Stripes of light from the window revealed the awful scene. The feeling of thousands of fibres dragging across my esophagus spewed my mind into a frenzy. A flood of minuscule wriggling masses came pouring out of my mouth, falling straight into hers. A few fell just shy of her mouth and crawled their way inside. I was able to spot one of them as it passed a blade of light. As its centre was a porous white body. 
sprouting from all angles were several dexterous strands that transported the grotesque masses at a disturbing speed and steadiness. Their form almost resembled the seed heads of a dandelions in a hideous caricature of nature. Tears came from my eyes as I was helpless, only able to watch. My jaw then clamped shut and I let go of her. I watched as the last of the creatures crawled inside. Her jaw remained open, grotesquely askew. Eyes wide, her face locked into an expression of shock. My body stood up robotically and my gaze remained locked on her as she began to convulse on the ground. I don't know how much more time I have before I become nothing more than an observer. The hours that I'm awake have begun to dwindle. I've lost track of time completely. I cannot say if it's been days, weeks or months. They know everything I intend to do. There's not much that can be done. There are others out there now who have lost their bodies and souls. All I can do is write about it with the time I have left. They sense no threat in these actions, perhaps because I know it's futile. What are they? How did they get inside that cut? I'll never have answers to these questions. All I know is that they'll continue to spread. Watch the people around you and take note of their strange behaviour. I wish all of you well. If you do not heed these warnings, you may end up like me, a passenger. I moved away from my parents and into my first apartment. It's a good location, close to town, beach and forest with lots of water, perfect for long walks and nature stuff. The forest pit has a lot of swamp area and direct access to flowing water on one side. It's about two and a half kilometers long by 500 meters wide. It's not the biggest forest, but it's the creepiest. I have walked many times in the past through forests at night time and I found it quite cozy and the darkness is very good for my light sensitive eyes. I haven't been scared in the past forests as far as I can remember. I remember the first time walking through this tiny forest, and I knew instantly that there was something not quite right. This wasn't daytime though. You know the expression, the forests have eyes? In this case, it's quite literal. You feel watched as soon as you enter and until you leave on the other side. The forest is so thin at times, you can see the water on the other side and know that you're alone. Yet, it feels like a thousand eyes are following your every move. I thought that it was just forest paranoia, but every time I come here, and it doesn't matter what time of the year, it's the same. Even dogs I meet on my way with their owners seem upset all the time. I was walking through it one evening to see if I could find the peace, which I usually could in other forests at night time, but that was a hard no. Not only did the eyes of the forest feel more appealing, but there was a feeling of dread there, which wasn't there at daytime at all. I started noticing balls of light, some big and others very small floating in between the trees. First, I thought that it was some sort of insect or maybe boats on the water, but after checking the water, there never were any boats. I just hurried home. I've been back to the forest both alone and with people, and all the time we noticed the balls of light. But they're on a hill where the path is at the top, and the hill goes about 10 to 12 meters down and then meets the water. The balls are floating seven to 10 meters above ground level in and out between trees. I don't like entering the forest anymore and I'll do my very best to avoid it. It's evil. The forest ends up to my parents area from my prior memory. And I'm not sure about its backstory since most of it is mouth to mouth. But I'll look into it as soon as I can. I'm a 29 year old woman. For years now, I've been having premonition dreams. I never know when they'll happen and they never have involved myself until last night. I also regularly travel to the fifth dimension, which also plays a strong part in what I'm about to tell you. Within my family, we believe that we're not fully 
human. We believe that we're from a fifth dimensional race who inhabit human bodies and have for almost the, the entire existence of the human race. We also believe that we are reincarnated into different people and live that person's life in order to experience this world fully. Each of us has memories of previous lives, but I'm the only one in my family who has memories from the first moment I inhabited somebody's body. Over the centuries, I've done that hundreds and hundreds of times over. But last night, last night, I saw one of the places where a previous body of mine was buried. I saw the gravestone of my previous self. Within the fifth dimension is a river known as the River of Memories, where all souls have to walk through. And if they keep even one finger above the water, that soul will keep some of the memories from his or his previous life. But the river isn't only for taking memories to make you a blank slate for your next life. It can also return memories that you wish to live through again. The problem is that if a part of you is submerged, you must give up a memory to receive a memory. I dipped my hand in the river last night and I saw my funeral from 200 plus years ago. I saw my friends and family standing around my grave, but I didn't recognize them. As I mentioned before, to gain a memory, you have to give up a memory. I'm sitting in my living room and I have no idea when or where I had a hanging picture in my living room taken. When I was 17, I was dating a girl who I'll just refer to as Kate. Kate is a friend that's super into the paranormal. One day, the three of us were hanging out with a few other people when a friend, who I'll call Sarah, had the bright idea of holding a seance. We all agreed to do it, thinking fuck all would happen. We began the seance, and surprisingly enough, after a couple of attempts, we were successful. We decided it was time to call it quits and moved on to play Uno. We're maybe two rounds in and the living room temperature dropped. It wasn't a crazy difference, but it was noticeable enough for us to ask Sarah to turn off her AC. Sarah got up and as she was walking towards the thermostat, a picture that was hanging on the wall beside it fell. We all heard it fall, but didn't think much of it. After she put it back up, the picture that was hanging on top of it fell. Then two more, and then the last picture on the wall fell. She turned to look at us and had a sarcastic, scared look on her face. Her sarcasm quickly turned to genuine concern when a TV, which was mounted on the wall, fell. It was after that moment that the lights began to flicker in and out softly. I stood up, ready to bail, when the lights completely went out. The coffee table we were all sitting around began to shake causing us to back the fuck away. We all ran out to the patio door and into the backyard to calm down. After 10 minutes, me and the only other guy there decided to be heroes and go inside to see what would happen. We walked throughout the house, seeing if we would trigger anything. Thankfully, nothing happened. We invited the girls back in and tried to think of a believable reason for her TV bro broken. To the best of my knowledge, Nothing else has happened in a house again. Here's a tale that comes from a little town in Lancaster County called Elizabeth Town. It's called the Purple Light Bridge and it's been a story that started in the early 1900s. It could be more than a tale though since there is proof of the purple light and the tragic tale behind it. So one of the tales is that a young boy is struck by a train on the bridge that intersects between Turnpike Road and High Street, which is where the train station for Amtrak is. It supposedly happened in 1934, and some people claim there's proof of the accident, but I personally am looking into it. I emailed the Historical Society. So after the boy's death, it is said late at night, you can see a purple light on the bridge or in the gorge where the train tracks runs into from the north, heading southwest. People like to argue you can see the purple lights at another location, and it's been there and not by the train station. They claim that you can see the lights under the bridge 
that is above the train tracks on Bosler Road. Bosler Road for the purple light had another tail. A mother brought her son to the bridge and under that bridge she hung her son by herself. Locals say that the purple light you see is the mother and son. Some people have claimed the purple light comes from the moonlight reflecting off the rocks below the ridge. Yet even more people claim that it's actually the bridge a couple of miles away in Newville, near Elizabethtown. I have not yet tried to investigate, but will update the findings on this page. Apparently, there's a man there who has video of these lights that hasn't contacted me back. Now we come to what has been said to me to be on par with most haunted places in Strasbourg with the Gondor Mansion. Funny thing about this story is that it was my first adventure in high school. Me, along with my brother, our friends Ethan and Human checked it out. This was before it was renovated and turned into a house which there are now local residents that live inside and turned it into a very beautiful property. At the time we went ghost hunting and even went into the abandoned house at the time. The house had a horse stable, a pond, and even once had a clubhouse that a local Boy Scout troop made as I was told. We didn't find any ghosts until we left and shined a light into the basement and saw a figure with a red material that freaked us out, which we thought may have been a curtain. But when we thought about it, there weren't any curtains we noticed when we were there. So that freaked us out. Another tale is from a friend who actually lives by there. He one time went there to camp with his uncle. They both set up a fire, waited till sundown. He told me that when sleeping, he heard something outside and they checked it out and found nothing. They dismissed it as just a squirrel or any animal that would be running around at night. Upon getting in the tent though, he let out a scream because he felt someone grab his shoulder behind him while his uncle was in front of him. They both left and never went there at night again. So you're probably thinking, why is this place called Hell's Funnel and how did it get its name? It happened with only one day in the early 20th century. While working, when the property used to be a sawmill, there was an accident where a man slipped and the saw blades dismembered either his hand or whole arm. The property is on the outskirts of Strasbourg, so getting to a hospital wasn't much of an option. So the man instead rushed home and sat on the front porch to see us one last time. His wife instead only saw her husband suffer and eventually bleed out and die. His wife, going into a depressed state, decided then to take her own life, to be her husband. The property is said to be haunted by the both of them. The pond by the house is said to have spirits seen over the top of the water. There are also stories of a woman's spirit walking around the area of the pond, or on top of the surface too. Some people claim to have been scratched by something while approaching the pond or grabbed. My friends, who I mentioned before, camped by that pond when he was grabbed. So it was more substance when I hear people claim that. Yet that's only one of the stories I've heard. There's another with a way darker turn. This one starts just like the first story of the man cutting off his hand or arm with a saw blade while cutting a log. It was his good hand that he used to work with too. So not being able to work his job due to his disability, the sawmill fired him. Eventually, not being able to work, this angered the man. So with his other hand, he picked up an axe and headed back to the sawmill. Seeking revenge, he hacked up all of the workers at the time, then took his own life. Story has it that all those souls became trapped there, forming a funnel right to hell. That's why you see spirits there, because they're damned souls that escaped hell, and one's on their way into hell. Or perhaps the souls the man killed lingering in the place, trapped where they were killed. If you look at the trees, there as well above the road, they curve inward. So this house I lived in for a short time as a kid was always very dark. All the shadows seemed to lean on the house. 
My parents' bedroom didn't have a window either. One night, I was sleeping in the basement because that was where my room was. And from a very deep sleep, suddenly my eyes popped open. And I had that feeling like someone was standing in the room. It was really weird because this only happens to me even as an adult when someone comes into the room while I'm asleep. I was really confused, looked around and didn't see anything and tried to sleep. I just couldn't. So I decided I was going to get up and go pee. There was only one washroom in the house and it was on the first floor next to my parents' room. Got up, headed for the door. Before I reached the door, the door slammed shut. I'm terrified at this moment. I reached for the handle and turned the knob and pulled on the door. And it wouldn't open. I kept trying to pull on the door, getting frantic. I was very strong as a kid. The door was bowing for me pulling on the door. Like someone was holding it shut above my head. I remember screaming, let me out. Mom, Dad. Nobody could hear me. I eventually managed to get the door open and flew up the stairs to the bathroom, flicked on the light, then went to my parents' room and tried to open the door, but it was locked. I tried banging on the door, asking to let me in. I ended up staying in the bathroom for probably an hour because it's the only place I felt safe with the light. I was even scared to go out in the living room, which I eventually did to grab a pillow and a blanket and slept on the bathroom floor with the light on. In the morning, my parents found me and asked me why I wasn't in bed and instead upstairs in the bathroom. I told them what happened. My parents said they heard nothing. Not me screaming, not me banging on the door trying to get in. My dad, of course, didn't believe me. My mum did, though. I refused to ever sleep in the basement again. My dad was mad and I didn't care. I slept on the couch for weeks, sometimes in front of their door or in the bathroom because I was so scared until they would bring my bed upstairs. Many things happened in this house and the area is very old. I lived in this house for a very short time while I was in kindergarten. This is an old town, one of the first in my province. This will be a telling of three different experiences. Around Christmas time, the weather was fair. It wasn't windy or too cold. I was watching a TV show. I do believe it was Letters to Santa or something. It was on YTV. I was sitting in front of the TV watching my show with the remote beside me. And the TV would flip to the news. A little confused, I would swap it back with the remote. And after a couple of minutes, it would swap to the news again. I was getting a little annoyed. So I called out to my mum who was in the kitchen and asked why she kept swapping the channel and if she wanted me to watch something else. She looked right at me and said the remote is beside you. I'm not touching the TV, which it was. Right after, I asked her this, the TV started to flip through a bunch of channels. Then our old touch lamp started to act up. Like someone kept touching it and turning it all the way up and off all the way up and off over and over. And then it kept swapping through all the channels. A little freaked out, I yelled, stop, switch it back to my show and stop messing with the lamp. Immediately it stopped and flipped it back to my channel. Nothing like this happened to me again. My mum watched the whole thing and I remember turning to her shrugging in my shoulders. My mum also told me she had been experiencing the light being turned off in the kitchen. And it couldn't have just been the power because the light switch would be off. And this would happen to her all the time while she was just in the kitchen making food. Figure over my bed. This was shortly after I had asked my parents to move my bed upstairs. I was laying in bed with the street lights coming in the window. And I woke up to a really cold breeze in my bed. Not thinking much, I looked around and saw nothing. And suddenly my curtains, which were the gauzy white see-through ones, flew up over my bed. Like some strong breeze came from under my bed and threw them over the top of me. It was weird, but weirder they fell over the figure of a woman standing by my bed. It scared me. I sat upright and pulled the curtain out of the way so I could see better. And there was no one there. I was terrified, but I just threw my blankets over my head and went to sleep. 
and just said, go away, go away. Closed my eyes real tight. Cowbone in the muck. More creepy, less supernatural. So as a kid, I was all about getting dirty and playing in the mud. I would find mud pits, get as dirty as humanly possible, and then go back home. Change and wash and come back. I had gone out into this mud pit that was right across the street from my house. My parents had left me at home. But this was a small town, and everyone watched everyone's kids. So I'm out playing in the muck up to my knees in mud, digging around, and I happened to find a cow bone. I pulled it out, and as I was making my way back to the street, I sank into some mud up to my hips and couldn't get out. A nice guy came by and fished me out with a shovel, asked me if I was okay. Everything was cool. When my parents got home, I showed them the bone and we cleaned it off. Later on, me and my friends made a ford outside made of twigs. It was pretty awesome. I put my cow bone in it and came back the next day. While we were looking at the cow bone, we noticed something weird about it. And I went to pick it up. And thousands, thousands of daddy long legs came pouring out of this bone. We promptly, then shortly after that, wasps took it over. So it had to be torn down. A couple of weeks go by and I'm laying on the floor at my house, sleeping. My aunt's sitting beside me, and I feel tickling. I giggle, and I say to my aunt, stop. She says, honey, I'm not tickling you. So I go back to sleeping. More tickling. I say, auntie, please stop. I'm trying to sleep. And she says, I'm not tickling you. I pull the blankets I'm under, and I'm covered in daddy long legs. I scream, hop up, start crying, and brush them off and run to my mum. My mum says it's okay, they're harmless, they won't follow you. Well, they followed me across the floor to my mum, and even my mum was freaked out. I hated that house so much for all the creepy stuff that happened. The first apartment I lived in after I got married was located in what's known as the NoHo Arts District. It was a nice one bedroom built most likely in the 1920s. We loved the one bedroom. The only thing I didn't like was that it was in the front of the building's first floor, 10 feet from the sidewalk with no fence. Having lived in lesser areas, it made me slightly nervous. The energy of the place was good until about four months in. I woke up to the footsteps in the hardwood floors in the living room I could hear them clearly, as did my wife once she got up. I could hear things being shuffled and more cautious steps. I pulled an old 45 that I kept in my dresser and waited facing the bedroom door. There was a one inch gap between the door and floor, I assume because it was once carpeted. We both could see the shadows of the person walking past the door. They went past the bathroom at the end of the hallway. Then nothing. It became silent, and I decided that I had to deal with this in an unfriendly way, and opened the door and turned to the bathroom. Nothing. No one was there or anywhere. All the windows were locked, and the chain on the doors were on. I had a hard time sleeping that night. A few months later, it happened again, but that time, as I touched the door handle, I could hear the front door open and then slam closed. The chain was hitting the door when it slammed. When I checked everything, it was the same, all locked, but the front door chain was also locked and had heard it bouncing on the door. It never happened again. And we moved to the end of the lease, despite what I thought initially was paranormal or a ghost. Last week, I started feeling like a cold was coming on. I tested negative then within 12 hours. I was really sick and then tested positive. The first few days were like a blur, sleeping in and out all throughout the day. I self quarantined in my bedroom away from the rest of my family. I didn't leave my bedroom for almost five days. I don't know which night it was, but it was probably Sunday or Monday. I woke up to someone standing in my room. 
It first looked like a tall, thin person draped in black and with a hood on. But then I saw it was a woman standing there, all in black and with long hair. I sat there in shock, just sweating out so much that sweat was dripping from my chin and nose. I looked at her, and she just stood there. Her shape was almost giving off fumes, like there wasn't a fine line to her outline, if that makes sense. Attached to my master bedroom is my master bathroom, and inside there is a nightlight that turns on when motion detected. Well, that light triggered and turned on, so I turned to look at the bathroom doorway and the light. As soon as I turned back to look at the lady standing in my room, she was gone. Only a jacket hanging behind the door was there. I don't know how to explain it, but the jacket was there and has been there for weeks. But that wasn't the dark shape that I saw. The dark shape was closer, like toward the edge of the bed to me. Then all of a sudden, the motion light in the bathroom went off and I was sitting there in darkness. I reached around for the TV remote and the t turned the TV on, and then reached over and turned on my side table light, and stayed up until I guess I went to sleep again, which wasn't that long, it was all during my COVID times, I seemed to fall asleep a lot. Maybe it was the virus that made me see something, but I know what I saw, and I know that lights came on in the bathroom. I think had I not been so sick at the moment, I would have been more terrified. To say the least, things got quiet for a while and we became hopeful that all the steps we took drove the ghost off. I wasn't able to take all the advice given because some of it just wasn't a means we could do. Leaving a home you pay for when you already struggle isn't easy. Cash is tight and paying for elsewhere isn't possible. So while doing my own research, I was able to get the house cleansed. Afterwards, the continued ignorance of its presence went on strongly. Standing our ground, over some time, things happened less and less. Then eventually, it stopped altogether. It almost became a thing of the past for a bit there. I felt we all started to move on and push the memories back. That was until last night. I first noticed a heavy energy in my room as I was doing my routine for bed. The entire time I washed my face, I felt like someone was standing behind me, watching. I shrugged it off and blamed it on my own head. I continued on to do my skincare routine when I thought I could feel my robe being brushed open. It made my heart jump in my throat, that lightning chill went up my spine, and all the hairs on my body sank. I tried to swallow the feelings coming over me and push on, so push on I did. It was around 1.30am when I finally got into bed to sleep. However, the intrusive feeling lingered around the room. Everything I was doing felt like eyes were all over the room, watching. I got on my phone and started to chat with friends. I checked a few things to make plans for the coming sunrise. That's when I heard this clicking noise next to me. At first, when I looked to my right, it just looked like my normal closet door and bathroom door closed. I set down my phone and tried to focus on the TV that was playing on it. I checked my phone around 2.53am as I was exhausted from not being able to sleep. I sat up slightly for a drink of water, and that's when I first noticed it. The closet door began to slowly open. As I looked over, you could hear the door's normal squeak. As it continued to open, I sat in my bed and in the sheets. I closed my eyes and slowly turned my back towards it to lie on my left side. The sound of my heart could be heard beating out of my chest as I kept telling myself, it's nothing. There's a logical explanation you just haven't seen yet because you're tired. Get to sleep. I repeated that a few times, telling myself to go to sleep. Moments had passed and I had calmed my breathing, feeling relaxed enough to drift into sleep finally. It felt like something was in the bed with me, just breathing on the back of my neck. A helpless feeling came over me, so I jumped up and turned my light on. Walked to the closet door, turned its lights on and opened it. I walked inside and this feeling, it felt like overwhelming loneliness just surrounding me. If I hadn't walked out of there and closed the door, I would have sunk into the door and cried right then and there. Getting back into my bed felt different than it did just hours ago. 
I did feel fear or anxiety anymore. I turned on my right side and faced the closet until I fell asleep. As I woke up, everything felt normal. In fact, I actually feel good today. Like I'm full of energy and I shouldn't have on only roughly four hours of sleep. I guess I'll see how it goes from here. I want to say I was at least 11 at the time. My parents would always take us to my grandparents' house. My gr father worked for my grandfather and they lived out in BFE. There was nothing for miles and miles. If you were to scream, nothing would hear you. So when we would visit, it was a guarantee that we were staying a while. They always stuck us kids in the back room. This room is pretty much the storage room of the house. Anything that was to be packed away and out of sight made its way back there. Boxes of old pictures, toys, clothes over the years were all scattered throughout the room. Tall shelves filled with non-perishable items. An extremely tall standing deep freezer took up a decent side of the wall by the door and made enough noise to even wake the dead. There were two beds near the back of the room. One was a queen bed that was on a high metal bed frame. Then next to that was a small twin nudged into the corner. Between these beds was a small nightstand with a touch lamp that sat up in, upon it. Then there was the closet. It was such an odd little walk-in closet. No clothes were ever hung in there. But there were many more boxes of old knickknacks, vinyls, etc. that seemed to be tossed there and forgotten about. At night, that closet had more than a few boxes of junk on it. I always hate sleeping closest to the closet. I've had this unnerving feeling like something was waiting to pounce on me at any moment of the night. When the moonlight would shine through the window and hit the boxes just right, it would look like a man in a top hat standing in the very corner of the closet, just staring at you. The longer you stared at it, the more it seemed to morph into something more sinister. Usually, there were three of us that slept back there, and I was always the oldest. So me being the oldest, they always stuck me closest to the closet, knowing that the other two would put up a fight because they were frightened of what was lurking. I'll never forget this one night. It was myself, my cousin and my younger brother. Hugs and kisses all around and we were tucked in tight for the night. A tap on the touch lamp and the parental units were out of sight, making their way to the door. Watching what little light disappeared along the walls as they closed the door behind them pitch black tonight. Couldn't even see your hand in front of your face, it was so dark. Apparently, the moon wasn't shining bright that night because there were no beams of moonlight peeking in from the window. Laying there, I could hear them toss around trying to find a comfortable spot to fall asleep. Not long after snoring, I laid there, glaring into the darkness, uncomfortable as I could ever be. Then I hear a loud crashing noise. Laying there, I'm analysing where it came from. My cousin still sounds asleep next to me, and I can hear my brother in the bed next to us snoring. I didn't hear any of the adults come into the room. I sat up in the bed, scanning the dark room, trying to see what made such a loud noise. Then I pan my eyes over to the closet, where in the back of the closet, I see two red, beady eyes glaring back at me. I gasp and cover myself with my blanket feeling safe because I can't see whatever was looking at me from under the covers. Just then, the bed starts to shake. The old metal frame is creaking so loud it wakes my cousin, and I can hear her in her voice how scared she is as she asks me to stop. She's confused and scared, not knowing why the bed is making so much noise and violently shaking back and forth. She's reaching over to my side of the bed to see if I was next to her, and she realises I'm laying next to her and she darts straight up in bed, screaming. The bed continues to violently shake for what felt like an eternity. The door then flings open, and there's light filling the room from one of the parents dashing in to see what was going on. As they made their way to the touch lamp and tapped it on, the bed stops. My cousin and myself are both looking at each other with such terror and confusement. Our well, parents didn't even ask what had happened, but I assumed we were goofing around, jumping up and down on the bed, screaming like wild children when it was past our bedtime. They decided to separate us and stuck me in the twin bed in the corner 
and placed my cousin and my younger brother in the queen bed this time, thinking this would solve our late night shenanigans. Again, with the tightly tuckins but no kisses. We got Electra, and again with the fading light along the wall as they descended from the room once more, it took some time to finally succumb to my sleepiness. This time, I was woken up by what felt like hundreds of mice crawling all over me. I had been tempted to sit up, but was held down by an unseen force. I couldn't kick, move or scream for help. I laid there begging for it to stop. Looking down from what I could see was the blanket moving around like there were little creatures running all over me from under the blanket. Then I saw one scramble from under the blanket at my feet. It slowly turned and darted straight for my face. I remember seeing same, the same red beady eyes from the closet I saw earlier just running up my body from my feet to my face. I had closed my eyes so tight before it had gotten to my face. I didn't feel the sensation of mice all over my body anymore, but I was too terrified to even open my eyes. I laid there, listening to the room. I gained the courage to open my eyes, and I saw light coming in from the window outside. It was morning. I sat up in bed, saw them laying in the queen bed beside me sound asleep. I turned to look towards the closet and see nothing but the dusty old boxes and junk. Was it a dream? I thought to myself. It wasn't a dream. That was just one night out of many others I had experienced in that back room. It's been years since I've been in that house and I never plan to go back. I'm not really sure what it was exactly that was in that room and why it seemed to torture me out of all of us that slept back there. But recently, I found out that when my mother was younger, she had the same experience as I had when sleeping there. So tell me, why would she let us sleep back there if she knew there was something back there? <laughs>